Hi there everybody, how's it going? Welcome back to my channel and welcome to another episode of Should You Pull for Dissidia Final Fantasy Opera Omnia. Now today's banner is actually probably, I say probably because we don't know 100% for sure, the last banner that we're going to get before we start delving into the magical world of LD and burst weapons coming in the near future. So we'll have that to look forward to when it comes to the next community stream. But right now, we're going to be taking a look at Trey and Quistus's event and the banner that comes along with them. Now Trey's Chaos is actually known as being very difficult for a lot of players when it came around in JP so I shall do my best to kind of take you guys through some tips and tricks that you can take in order to complete Trey's Chaos particularly if you don't plan on pulling for any of the characters on the banner as well as looking at Trey and Quistus themselves to see what they get from their EX weapons, their new kits, all sorts of good stuff so if that's something that you guys are interested in then stay tuned and keep on watching. As always, everybody, don't forget to check out all of the social media links in the description box below, including Twitter, Twitch, Discord, and of course Patreon. Twitch this week, I'm actually working this Saturday evening, so I cannot be able to give you guys some more Final Fantasy IX, but I'm working on doing something on the, in the morning instead, so do let me know what kind of things you'd like to see from me that are instead of Opera Omnia that you guys could tune into and come and watch me alongside on Twitch. And with offline mode, I've actually been contemplating starting again, because... If you guys know, then we've got so many strong banners that are live right now with free pulls. And since I started allowing myself free pulls, I've realized, hold on a minute, I could be starting the game with things like Raijin and Aranea and Sherlotta. And I'm con honestly considering starting all over again. So sound off in the comments below if you think that that's something perhaps worth looking into. And then with Patreon, I obviously shout out one of my random patrons every time I make a video so that I can give thanks to each and every person who wants to support the channel further. And today that person is going to be Maxim one to one So thank you ever so much for your support. It means the absolute world to me, as you all know. And then of course, don't forget to check out all of the websites related to what Peromia and Clean Dissidia Info, OO Tracker, Tombree Troop, Dissidia DB, and all of that good stuff. And of course, all of the other content creators out there besides myself. So as usual, before we go into the banner itself, we're going to take a look at Trey's chaos event, or the chaos part of his event, before we actually go and have a look at what he can do. And this one in particular, I wanted to give a particular highlight to, because it's well known in the community, or at least it was when it first came out in the JP side, for being extremely difficult. Now there are multiple reasons why this event is seen as more difficult than others. The first of which is how strict the score and turn count is for this particular fight, given how much health the enemies have, and the speed at which they act, 75 turns is actually a very limiting sort of constriction on how well you can do and who you can bring to this particular fight. It's actually very difficult just to be able to get the score requirement done. So bringing characters who take advantage of dealing damage without taking up turns, characters like Kais for his launch or Afmal for her free turns, or even Ramza. Ramza I've seen quite a few clears of this particular fight with just because of his HP triple plus where he does brave gain HP plus and it doesn't take his turn count which means that he's providing buffs, brave regens, things like that without actually taking up your turn counts. Eld Nash is actually fantastic for this particular fight as well because his warp doesn't mean that or means that he doesn't add to your turn count while still dealing a really respectable amount of damage and he also brings along a lot of defensive properties as well through his terror debuff that make him pretty ideal for this particular fight. But to talk about the actual boss of the fight itself, the evil gaze, which are very weird looking versions of the Gyla cat enemies so you know those cute little floating cats that meow every time you hit them well now you're going to fight these weird ones that look like they came straight out of the Binding of Isaac instead, which still make the same meowing noises. But these guys are actually a little bit of a nightmare to deal with because they're so fast. And most of the, uh, the moves that these guys do tend to inflict either instant break, which in that, and then they instantly break you even if the attack misses. So if you remember the Ky flying chimeras from Fran's Lost Chapter, then you'll kind of know what to expect here. But there are multiple moves that these guys do that can instantly to break your units and because of their low action delay on the majority of their attacks they can just insta break you and then instantly kill you straight after so you're gonna want to have some level of control over the enemy's speed which is why Trey and Quistis are the featured characters for this because they interrupt these like chains of commands like Quistis can lower their turn rate lower their speed make sure that they actually just get to a point where they're controllable and they're not just going crazy every turn and then Trey is a trap based character so he interrupts their turns by making sure that they're like taking damage, taking bravery damage between each of their turns so it makes them that much more controllable. 
Afmao, I think, is actually a fantastic character for this, purely because even in the first wave, you have the water or the tears eyes, which like to inflict like speed down debuffs on you, and having that debuff evasion from Afmao in combination with the fact that she gets so many free turns, her damage output is great, she has healing, she's kind of like the Swiss army knife of support characters, will help a great deal here. If not, you could bring Arciella as well, because her HP silence even though the enemies act very quickly, that HP silence is still really, really relevant, and having fast cast active to make it so you're more safe to deal HP damage, so that it, because you know you're going to get that bravery refunded more quickly, is going to be a real player here as well. Saz, like I've said before, is like another character who's very, very turn efficient. He's very quick as well, so he's able to get in in terms of making sure that the enemies don't get out of control while still providing really nice buffs to your entire party. Obviously, Charlotta and characters that are, uh, you know, synergy for the event are going to be brilliant for this, but obviously with a list of characters that I put to the side here, they're all non-synergy, but Charlotta will make your life a lot easier here as well as, you know, Trey or Quistis or anything like that. Garnet is actually also very good here because the Imperil Enchant in combination with the amount of brave refund that she can do, the batteries, the healing, she, like Afmau, is a bit of a Swiss army knife, and because she has those Imperils, it will help you a great deal. Bear in mind that the enemies do like to cleanse non-framed debuffs, so if you are bringing an Imperil like Garnet or Rydia even, somebody like that, then just bear in mind that they can cleanse themselves of it. I'd like Raijin as an Imperiler for this, particularly in combination with Eldnarsh, because between the two of them, you have so much control over your enemy's turns, because if they're attacking all of you or Eldnarsh, they can't move because of Terra, and if they're not, then that's the time in which you can use Raijin to, uh, to HP plus and paralyze the enemies so that you can keep control of them for as long as possible while still maintaining an offensive presence. So as long as you're keeping control of the enemy's speed one way or another, because with Raijin in particular, he is very slow, so you need to counteract that with faster characters. As I said, Saz is very good here. Afmau is very good here. Eldnarsh is pretty perfect for this. There's a lot of characters you can use, but it's more restrictive than a lot of Chaoses out there. This is the last Chaos as well before we're going into a new era. So in theory, if you wanted to, you could wait until Squall comes around. And then if you really wanted Squall, you'll have access to Burst. So which means you can come back and then do this with a much, much easier time because you'll have what is essentially a secondary summon. And one thing I'll point out here as well is that I, instead of putting a picture of the boss or anything like that, I thought I could actually be a bit more helpful and put recommended summons and friend units here. So in terms of summon, most of the clears I see use brothers, but I would also recommend using Leviathan if you're struggling to keep on top of the enemy's speed because you're reducing their speed quite nicely. So it, it, it actually does add up if you're using characters. If you have Quistis who can inflict speed downs and things like that, then having access to more of that speed down. Ramza as well with that frame speed down debuff while he's still providing everything else, also fantastic. If not, you could always use Shiva uh, if, you want, if you need a little extra attack, but you also want that speed buff when you're below initial bravery so that you're able to kind of get your next turn a little bit quicker. That's always going to be really helpful. In terms of friend unit, the two I've seen most in terms, to, in terms of clears are either Kais or Charlotta. Kais for obvious reasons, because he is kind of just the premier summon, during a summon phase, go crazy with damage, just inflict loads and loads of hits and loads of launches, because launches are technically damage without taking turns. So they are like the, you know, the launch mechanic in and of itself is going to be very helpful here. If not, then Charlotta, if you're using a Charlotta of your own, we've used it for months where you have two Charlottas just using crystal generation all over the place and damage just going through the nose because you have two lots of, uh, of Light of Creation, so you're getting 40% extra damage during those phases. So those two would be my most recommended friend units. Now this one is challenging. Like From what I've seen and from what I've spoken to from other people, it is a challenge. So if you're struggling with it, then it's gonna give you more impetus to perhaps pull on this banner because Trey is very powerful and is perfect for this particular event. And Trey's not a disappointing character either. He would carry you for a fairly long while to come. So if you are struggling, there is no shame in trying to grab characters in order to be able to clear the content. 
So now let's take a look at some of the characters that are going to be featured on this banner. And first of all, we're going to look at Quistus, who gets a rework and a very nice one at that, in addition to the realization of her EX weapon. Now, Quistus was a character that was used for a very long time because of the sheer amount of delay that she has access to, and it actually just makes like a lot of summon board farming really easy obviously she's fallen to the wayside in favor of characters like Aranea and general leo and things like that but she's come back with a vengeance with this particular rework so her laser whip is still 12 skill uses which is pretty crazy given that she also with her c65 can give her can refund a skill use of both of her skills back while also adding a brave overflow effect to the party it now uh, gives a, a HP attack on use no matter how hard it hits, because a lot of the issues with Quistus's kit before is that both her EX and Laser Whip only actually did an HP attack if you, that you hit over 80 or 100% of her bravery, and then otherwise it would just be a brave attack, and that would be it, and it was very disappointing. But now she hits with, a brave with an HP attack no matter what the situation is, and she also gets a brave attack that p party batteries everybody for bravery, and her HP attack plus changes from a one-hit brave HP attack with a bit of overflow to a two-hit brave HP attack that also grants party bravery battery based on how much damage she deals, which includes herself, so it makes her a much safer character to use, because if she's been... You know, batteried and she deals her HP damage, her HP plus, and then refunds some of that ba bravery back, as well as batterying her party members, it makes a big difference to her. And then with Degenerator Whip, Degenerator Whip doesn't really need much of an overhaul because it's a party battery brave HP attack that delays the enemy by three turns, which is a lot. She only gets three skill uses out of it, four if you include her C65, but now it's actually going, you know, gives six hits instead of the three that it had before so it now hits that much harder and it's got 200% brave overflow which given that she already has a lot of brave overflow auras in her kit it's gonna hit pretty hard and it's still really good now looking at her ex weapon homing whip was a fast car like what like one of the premier fast recasting ex weapon at or ex attacks and it was really strong and it was it, just because of how frequently you could use it and bear in mind she has 12 skill uses on one of her skills she now has a decent hp plus she still has that get off me button in degenerator whip so now by having a really nice ex weapon on top of it because it was it was good but it was just kind of like a, a stop gap between degenerator whip uses whereas now it's actually relatively useful so not only does she inflict speed down, turn rate down as much within her kit to make it so the enemy is that much slower, she also gets some extra stuff with the realization. So before, like I said earlier, it only triggered an HP attack if your bravery went into overflow, which while relatively likely, there were still times where you were like, oh, please make sure that the bravery goes over the overflow. It wouldn't, and then it wouldn't trigger an HP attack, which for any X attack is very, very odd. But going into her realization, it now definitely triggers an HP attack after use, which is great. And it also inflicts a new debuff called Fading or Decaying Light for four turns, which lowers their offensive stats, which is kind of nice. So, like, not only is she lowering their speed, she's also lowering their offensive stats, and she's also making it so that your party is that much safer by having brave batteries on everything that she basically does. It just it makes her a very safe character to use. And then with 1 out of 3, she gets the stat buff, so that she makes it so that she's now on par with other Chaos level characters. At 2 out of 3, she gets her Instructor's Whip buff, which was the buff that she would always get out of her EX, EX attack, which raises her max bravery and her attack. But it now also, like, when you... It, like, it adds extra effects to Instructor's Whip, which now raises party uh, brave overflow for both gained and like stolen bravery. When they say stolen bravery, it means bravery you get by attacking, as opposed to through abilities that just gain it. And it also, you start the fight with that, and you start the fight by inflicting her new debuff on all enemies for four turns. So you start with a little bit of a leg up on things, which is quite nice. And then... With 3 out of 3, it makes it so that its brave hit count goes from 7 to 10, so it adds another 3 brave hits on it, and it also makes it so that after you've dealt the HP damage, it also raises her ally's bravery. So now her EX attack is also a party battery, so literally everything that she does raises her party's bravery in some manner or another, whether it be her HP+, plus, her Degenerator Whip, or her EX attack. It's all very nice stuff. Now, Quistus is a character that, like, you... like. 
you're certainly not wrong to, to max her out, purple or anything like that. She's a very strong character. But we've had so many, I'd be surprised if people still had ingots left. Like, I know I don't. I've been running real low on my realization materials. But I think that she's a really great character. And I, I wish I had more resources to be able to give them to her. Because I think that that level of speed down and turn rate down in combination with one another are very powerful. Just to, like, keep control over the enemies. And in combination with the delay that she has, if you use her alongside someone like Aranea, who has delay, and the power to make up for Quistis not dealing quite as much damage, it just, like, there's a lot of very nice things. And I actually failed to mention as well, with two out of three, her homing whip actually does splash damage as well, which makes her damage output a lot stronger. But, technically, like, typically she's very much a single target damage dealer, so she's not going to be dealing as much damage as some of the more recent damage dealers we've had, but it's still respectable, and she adds so much support to the party on top of this debuffing speed kit that she has, that I think she's definitely a character well worth looking at. So now we come to looking at Trey. Now, Trey's kit is very interesting. It's very unique. It's really fun, and it's extremely damage dealing, and it's very powerful. So, Trey's kit revolves around a unique gimmick in that whichever skills he doesn't use in a turn gets stronger on the turn following it. So, as it says here, with raining arrows and dynamite arrows, and later his HP plus as well, if unused, becomes dynamite arrow charge one on the next turn. Now, when it, with using his uh, C55, C60, that actually gets an added effect of it, where if you didn't use that one, it then gets charged to charge two afterwards. Now, charge one is just a little bit more, like, potency on each of the bravery attacks. It's not anything special. But with the charge twos, they actually transform quite a lot, and they get a lot more damage added to them, and a lot of little extras that are added to them that you wouldn't have had normally. So, Raining Arrows is a... AoE Brave HP attack that grants him a buff that gives him more max Brave and attack that also triggers his bravery and HP pluses as well. And then he also puts a buff on him that triggers traps after your opponents have acted. So Arrow Shower is it lasts for three turns if you use the charge two. So one of the things with the charge two on raining arrows is that it makes the arrow shower last a little bit longer. There is a trap much like Emperor or Cater. Characters like that, but instead of it being a debuff on the enemies, it's instead a buff on Trey. So once they've acted, it then does an AoE Brave HP attack that also, like, party batteries bravery at the same time. And it just, it's a great way of sort of inflicting damage on enemies between their turns, which is great, obviously, for his own event where enemies are quite as fast as they are just by sitting there. Like, he uses Raining Arrows, Charge 2, preferably, because you want to get as much out of the Arrow Shower as possible, in order to be able to just deal extra damage all the time. And then Dynamite Arrow, instead, is another trap, but this one is a debuff, and it acts a little bit differently. It reduces by one for any action taken, whether it be yours or theirs, and it only, like, it only has one turn on it. So basically, if a party member goes next, then they'll just extend the amount of damage that they take. If they go next, then, it, or if the enemy goes next, then it means that they're going to be taking more damage after they've acted, so it means that they're more likely to, to get broken. So with the 55 and 60 passives, Charge 2 on Raining Arrows makes it so that it has 6 hits. It's obviously an AoE Brave HP attack with split damage. It's not got splash damage at all, but it's it's still really powerful. It extends the duration of our shower, arrow shower to three turns instead of two, and it may, basically means that the arrow shower is slightly stronger. It's a two-hit brave HP attack on every action AoE, and it does actually add up a lot of damage. Dynamite arrow also gets splash damage if it becomes charged two, and it also means that the dynamite gets four is a four hit brave HP attack that actually does quite a lot of damage. He also gets a brave H, a, a brave attack plus that raises party bravery and then does a two hit bravery attack. So he doesn't. While a lot of his kit doesn't actually revolve around like party support as such, and like all of his buffs are to himself and not to the party, by having all of these damaging debuffs like actual brave damage, he actually adds a lot to the party in terms of. Like I said, when it came to his event, he does a lot of damage without actually adding to your turn count, because he does a lot of it between turns, and it turns out that it's actually very powerful. And then with his EX, his gimmick with Grand Delta, it's a 5-hit AoE Brave HP attack that's split damage again, 
to start with, it actually doubles up when you put books and ingots into it. But it inflicts a new debuff to the enemy for three turns if you put all your power stones and everything into it, called Lethal Arrow. Now this is a very unique debuff, because what will happen with it is any enemy that has this debuff will be broken no matter who hits it and what they hit it with. Like, any bravery attack will break it instantly. If they aren't already broken, they also take more bravery damage, so basically it's kind of like a Vital Crusher type situation where, alright, he doesn't provide stat bonuses to your party, but debuffs like this are so interesting and unique and powerful that he does add things to your party even though he is a damage dealer. So Lethal Arrow, literally just put it on anybody because he actually does start with his EX when he gets ingots and then that means that it's like insta break. No matter what you hit them with, you could hit them with the smallest attack and it'll still break them. It's really powerful stuff. And then with the book and ingots, with a book, just a book, it just makes it so that it deals more damage. So if you're going to be, I mean, at this point, it's the same for everybody. There are no budget heroes really anymore. Anyone that you're going to use is going to want three ingots at this point. So with a single ingot, he gets more stats as well he should. With two ingots, he gets his impeccable shot, which is the buff that he gets in order to trigger his HP plus and he'll, like, you know, his bravery attack, things like that as well as increasing his offensive stats. He starts with his EX gauge maxed out, which is very powerful indeed. Um, he also gets Raining Arrows and Dynamite Arrows start with a single charge. Now this is actually very powerful, because if he starts with his EX gauge maxed out and with the charges, it means he can use his, attack, his EX attack straight away, inflict the Lethal Arrow debuff, and then he will have not used his Raining Arrows or his Dynamite Arrow, so the next turn you have a choice between which one you want to use at charge level 2. And it just sets that ball rolling really, really nicely. So the chances are you'll probably use Raining Arrows charge 2 because then you'll get that extra turn of Arrow Shower and it means that it will charge back up again much quicker. So you just get that really nice kind of cyclical um, turn order in order to get the most out of Trey's damage. And then with 3 out of 3, Grand Delta doubles up on its damage because it becomes a 5 hit AoE Brave HP inflicted twice, which we always like because it means that if they've been party battery, you're always going to get more damage out of it. He also then gets an HP attack that behaves the same way as his skills do. As in, if you don't use it, it gets more powerful. So his HP, HP plus is a 2 hit Brave HP attack with a bit of overflow. Totally standard stuff. With a single charge, it just makes it so that it's got more potency on it. And then charge two, it then raises his bravery, is a three hit brave HP attack, and it also has more brave overflow on it. So it means that his longevity actually works out quite nicely, as his C65 ability also, with this, it only has one use, but it also recovers a skill use of both raining arrows and dynamite arrow. So basically, what Trey is, is he's just a constant barrage of traps and setup that just it makes the opponent really difficult, or like makes the opponent's moves really difficult because they're just going to be taking damage no matter what they do. Like, if it's not raining arrows, it's grand. If it's not raining arrows, it's dynamite arrow. If it's not dynamite arrow, it's lethal arrow. They're just constantly taking damage, and he's he makes it so that your damage output efficiency is really strong. I think that if you have characters like Aranea and things like that that do a similar kind of thing, like where you know, I don't think there's anything quite the same as Trey in terms of the power level in combination with the turn efficiency of being able to deal all this damage between turns. But there are a lot of damage dealers out there that can do good turn efficiency, like your Araneas, like your Kaisers, things like that. So while I think that Trey is really strong, there is a lot to look forward to in the near future. And as much as I don't want to say, like, you can skip Trey if you want to, you actually can, because he's like really powerful but we've got so much to come forward and i i mean i'll probably pull for trey because i think he's really unique he's really interesting he is very powerful but he and he's gonna last for at least until the rest of uh, chaos is used up and probably see use in some lufenia events as well just because his damage output is that high but if you are desperate and you haven't been able to get, or if you've had to like spend loads of resources in this past couple of months like most of us have then this is a banner that is ugh. I can't sit there and say it's not amazing because it is both Quistus and Trey are amazing but it'll like there are situations in which you could skip this banner if you wanted to 
In terms of artifacts, with Quistis, you just want attack and max bravery. They are by far the best things that you can give her. She doesn't have anything special, like her Cease 50 extens extension isn't there. She just wants offensive stats. Trey, he's going to want attack for definite, and then he's most likely going to want his C50 passive on top of that, his Erudite Archer boost, because it raises his attack and his max bravery. Why have one when you can have both? And, and um, his, it, the buff that it lists there is something that is always going to be active for him. So just go for a, a combination of attack one away, max brave 330, and Erudite Archer boost 2, and then you'll be fine. So now we come to the portion of the video that actually details whether we feel that it's worth pulling on this banner or not. And obviously for everyone's situation it's going to be different. Now, Quistus and Trey are both extremely powerful characters, but as I said at the beginning of this video, this is probably the last banner that we're going to have before the kind of next level of power creep, which will come in the form of LD and burst weapons. So whether you feel that this banner is worth your while to have kind of the last banner like we did with Shalotta before EX Plus became a thing, whether you feel that this is worthwhile for you is going to be entirely dependent on your current situation. Now, both of these characters, as I said, are very powerful. So honestly, I would pull if I had neither of these characters for a start, because honestly, in my opinion, if you have nothing on any banner, it's at least worth you looking at throwing a few tickets at it to see if you can get something out of it, because more EXs is going to be more relevant. However, do bear in mind that when burst banners come along, the rates of EX weapons actually increases. So this is probably the last banner that we're going to have that has those lowered rates. So if you're more concerned with quantity than quality, it may be worth you holding off. However, if you want access to Quistus's heavy speed debuffs in order to help control certain bosses, then it's actually, you don't really get much better in terms of speed sort of control than you do with Quistus because you have her unique debuff to, to lower their offensive stats, you have speed down and turn rate down all in one kit whilst being able to battery your entire party, whilst having the delay from Degenerator Whip. She's still a really good character for summon, form, for summon farming at this point. If you wanted a combination of using her with, say, Leo or Aranea or anything like that, then she will do you very well. If you're struggling with Trey's Chaos event and you aren't, and you really want to get it done, because there's no shame in skipping an event either. If you just want to clear something, then you can go through it, like revive with 100 gems if you absolutely have to. I, I mean, I would never do that, and I, I never condone it as such, because it's like spending gems. But if you have to, you can do it just to get the ingots and what have you out of it, um, or nuggets rather. If you really want to finish it though, then there is no shame in pulling on a banner to be able to clear all content, because ultimately that is what you're pulling to do, is to be able to clear content. And Trey and Quistis will make your life a lot easier with this particular event, because it is well known for being a difficult one. But similarly, if you can finish all content, including Trey's Chaos, with what you have and without the banner characters, then it does make this banner a lot less desirable. You can kind of hold off without it. Trey, I think, is such an interesting character, and he is extremely powerful. Like, the amount of damage he can churn out without actually having to do anything, purely because of the number of traps that he lays down. If you're against multiple enemies, he does a lot of damage between turns, and it's in an unconventional way that doesn't really impact your other characters, so he'll pair up very well with a lot of party members. And if you want access to Lethal Arrow and that ability to just instantly break an enemy, then Trey is going to be really good for you. Like, he's going to last certainly until Lufenia happens. There's a lot of Chaos fights in which he's going to be really useful. He's, he's just really powerful. If you wanted to save for future content, like I said, then, like, you know, there's a lot of changes coming to the rates in which we get EXs because they're kind of bumping LD weapons to the similar sort of rates we have with EX weapons now and then making EXs a little bit more common and you're going to find that there are a lot more widespread EXs. You're going to be pulling a lot by accident because you'll be pulling for an LD weapon and then get somebody's EX that you weren't expecting. Then you could save up for that. There's going to be a lot of like, some people are going to be really heavily saving for Squall's Burst because they know that he's got a rework coming like later down the line and he becomes a really heavy damage dealer and they're going to want like that first burst. They're going to get caught up in the hype of having the 
first one. Or a Midatelian is going to come out and she's a very popular character, so maybe that's something you might want to save for that's coming out over the next month, then you could use this as a, like a, a time to sort of recuperate your resources after quite how many banners we've had with such powerful characters. I do think that this banner is worth pulling on, but there are circumstances in which you can avoid it if you have to. If you already have Quistis, because a lot of people pulled for her the first time around because of her affinity for summon board farming and things like that, you could just go in, give her your ingots and things, then finish Trey's Chaos, and then just use her instead of Trey. While they are very different, she will still get the job done. So I think this banner is really good. And it really good, in fact, and I probably will pull for Trey. Be, well, in part because if I do get Trey, he'll actually be my 100th EX that I managed to get before bursts. And to me, that's a really like lame but kind of cool thing that I'd like to be able to do. And I would use him, and I think he's very good. I, I, I don't think that I'm personally going to put ingots into Quistis, because I have other characters like Kefka that can do a similar job. Even if it's even if it's a little bit more unwieldy to put into a team than Quistis is, but obviously everybody's situation is going to be different. So sound off in the comments below and let me know if you plan to pull for Quistis, if you plan to purple Quistis, and what teams that you'd like to pair her up with. And the same goes for Trey. So that's going to be it for today's video. Do like I said earlier, sound off in the comments below and let me know whether you plan to pull on this banner or whether you're saving for future, whether you're saving for Squall or a Mid-Italian, or even if you're saving for like Noctis further down the line, because those who've been like keeping up with JP know that Noctis's burst is really something to be looking out for. In theory, this is actually the last banner that we're gonna have before burst banners start coming up. So I'm very much looking forward to seeing what the community stream has to say next week. And as I'm sure you guys are all as well, but that's going to be it from me, so don't forget to like the video, share it out, subscribe to the channel, and of course, of course click that bell for notifications for any future videos that I shall be making. And obviously come and find me on Twitch or Discord if you want to ask any questions, and hopefully I will see you guys in the next video and stream. So that's going to be it from me. Take care everyone, see you soon, bye!